Um, well, thank you for joining me this morning. It's a very early morning. I'd appreciate you taking time out for either from sleep or breakfast. Um, my name is Jeff Hu. I am a principal engineer at VMware, and it is my pleasure today to talk to you about the journey from virtualization to the software-defined data center. So if we take a big step back and look at sort of the industry over the decades, we've seen a series of transformations. IBM started it off actually with uh, the mainframe and uh, through the decades uh, we had the mini computer, you know, the PCs when it was possible to build the entire system on a chip um, and then the internet in the 90s uh, was, was born and then uh, you had a lot of distributed computing, client-server programming. We're sort of in this era now where um, you know we're introduced virtualization to the data center in 2000, where virtualization has sort of led to cloud computing. Um, there's obviously other dynamics in play besides virtualization, but we're sort of in this era right now um, where things are changing once again. Um, so zeroing in sort of the last uh, sort of era because that's one that matters to us most. Um, you know, we started with this approach where you had a desktop PC connected to some network, backed by some servers, and over the last few years, just the last half decade or so, the number of different ways you can get connected to services has increased a lot. You got thin clients, um, laptops, you know, smartphones, tablets, um, and probably more ways in the future. Now, if we sort of consider the human side of all this, um, you know, what does this mean to the way we experience technology and the way we work? Well, you know, a, a lot of sort of what the desktop was about was really about automating and simplifying sort of, the, sort of this document model where, you know, the office worker's job was mainly to process documents that came in, send them out, and a lot of, you know, w what was automated with the computer was uh, sort of a lot of this work. Um, so that's sort of also where sort of we think the name the desktop you know, computer comes from because it was actually on the desktop. And it was largely, again, about processing documents. Um, and then when the internet came along, email was sort of the first kill application. Again, that's all about sending documents. Now, the more recent experiences that people have been expecting are ones where you have mobile devices and you expect to be able to access your data anytime, anywhere, and you expect it to be up to date. So um, as a consumer, you know, I remember the days when you know, the banks would tell you, check your bank statement every month, but these days you can just go online and you can see right then in real time what, the, what, your, what your latest transactions have been. And so there's been a change in experience in terms of what the demands are. Um, not only do you expect it real time, you expect it to be there at the point at, at which you are and you carry the devices with you. Now, a lot of uh, you with kids, um, you know, they're, they're, a lot of the sort of teenagers these days, you know, if you ask them sort of how they communicate, they don't write too many messages these days. I bet, I bet a lot of them actually just, you know, ch chat on Facebook or Twitter. Chat's probably not even the right word to explain what, what's going on with that sort of social interaction. But this is sort of explaining a different way of working where it's more stream-centric, where the knowledge worker's job is to take these different streams of information and basically, ch you know, change them, add them together, and then send them out. Um, and this is a very different way of operating, and, and, our, and our IT systems sort of be able to sort of support that. And so, as we transition sort of from sort of where we are today with a bunch of servers, you know, there's this increasing demand for being able to do things with information that wasn't uh, demanded many years ago. So the other sort of trend I want to mention too is that if you remember my sort of chart through the decades, one thing you might have noticed was that you know as you went from the mainframe, you know the computers got smaller and smaller. As 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 uh, you can pack transistors more densely, you can make the computers smaller, and that created sort of this this ability to have a new form factor at each step of the way. And so I think sort of we're we're sort of at this point now where it seems like you know things are kind of changing. It used to be that IT was sort of the one that decided, that controlled, you know, sort of all the computing resources used in the enterprise. IT would buy the machines, IT would make, install them, set them up, make sure the information was, sit, was avail available, it was, it was secure. Um, but we're beginning to see a, ch a shift where what's happening in the consumer space, what, what you can do, you know, outside um, and, and in your social media, and, and we're seeing that sort of feed back into the enterprise. And so now, um, you know, you probably remember a few years ago that, you know, when the iPhone and the Android came on, you know, it came on really quickly and, you know, I'm sure you, either you in IT or your IT departments were struggling to try to sort of come up with solutions that would let people use their devices. Um, so, so this, this 
trend, um, I, we don't think will actually stop. Um, you know, things may have settled down into sort of, the, sort of the iOS and Android worlds, but there are these SaaS applications on the horizon and, you know, services like Dropbox where, you know, consumers want to be able to share their files. And so this is sort of feeding, we believe, a, a expectation, a pressure to, for IT to adapt much more rapidly as consumer expectations are um, changing. So at VMware, we sort of believe that what we see ahead of us is, is this sort of big transformation in the data center. Um, we think the whole thing's going to change. And it's, it's going to change at three levels. You know, obviously the first level, which is, you know, where we operate in, is in the sort of the infrastructure space where, you know, with servers, with virtualization, they become more cloud-like, more flexible, more, you have more, you don't really know exactly where, where the workloads are going in the data center. But as we look up the stack, um, you know, I talked a lot about sort of how the mobile devices is really changing the way that people want to work. I, I think that sort of converges on applications where uh, you need these, you know, new applications in order to be able to offer these experiences that people want in the mobile space. The, these applications need to be much more real time and they need to be much more analytical. And so, you know, some of the big trends we're sort of seeing is that uh, this big data trend, which, which you all know, that's what this conference is about, is that it's about you know being able to get computation, bring it to bear to the problem at hand, and um, whereas a lot of big data today is really about offline analytics, we believe over time we're going to see that this these analytics are just going to be built right into the, the real time work streams. So if you sort of imagine sort of every credit card transaction, your credit card company is very interested in having lots of checks go on, and how many checks can they actually go on in a, in a second? There's quite a few that actually can happen. So we think that there's this sort of big change happening, you know, across these three levels in the in the IT stack, um, and you know we want to sort of uh, you know help you make that transition. So most of the, what I'm going to talk about the rest of this sort of half hour is about the infrastructure. That's where we're historically um, you know strong in. So that's my also my focus. So if we look at what virtualization has uh, done to the data center, you know, we, we started from a world where it took weeks to provision a new, a new machine, a new server. And with virtualization, we got it down to, you know, within minutes, give or take, you know, a few, depending how long it takes to copy files around. Um, but in the enterprise, a virtual machine is not a complete service. Um, you know, your virtualization team may then you know, want to create the virtual machine, but before that virtual machine can actually be up and running, you still have to go out and provision some enterprise storage. You need to provision some LUNs. You need, might need to provision some networks. The VLANs need to be provisioned. That's perhaps the networking team's job. And then the security team gets involved. You've got firewalls, intrusion detection system, security monitoring tools. Um, so, so security has to do some work too. And then, then you start worrying about the application around, you know, you might have some load balancers. Maybe it's a hardware load balancer you've got to configure and set up. Um, and then you might have some clustering services. Um, so what may have been minutes actually still ends up being many days, um, you know, at the very best as you go through and, you know, try to get all those things lined up so that you can create the virtual machine. And so the vision that we have at VMware is um, what if we could do to compute and network and memory, you know, virtualize, virtualize it to the rest of the data center. And the idea is that you want to, you know, build this sort of virtual data con center construct where all your resources are virtualized and all the services you need, um, you know, from like networking, security, um, and also, uh, you know, so load balance application level services are all sort of part of that virtual center or virtual data center. And, um, so you would have virtual machines running in them, you know, they, they would sort of be mapped to the resources at the right time. And the idea is that it should be hopefully easy and quick to create a new virtual machine. Um, the number we have is three minutes instead of two minutes, but presumably to, to configure and set up those other services. So with that sort of thought in mind, we sort of arrive at this concept we call the software defined data center. Um, and, and I'll read that and sort of explain what it means in a second. Um, so a software data center is a data center in which all infrastructure is virtualized, delivered as a service, and the control of the data center is entirely automated by software. Um, so, so software defined data center, you know, th that's a pretty long term to, to sort of say software is important. Um, but I think there's, there's an interaction between hardware that I want to sort of call out here. This is not to say, um, you know, that hardware is, is going away, hardware is not relevant. Hardware is, of course, incredibly important in, in, the, bit, in the substrate on which software actually runs. Um, but we think to get to this new level of agility, you need this sort of software substrate layer on top that gives you the flexibility to, to basically create um, your, virt your resources, provision yeah, your virtual machines, and so and allow you to move your workloads anywhere in the data center. And 
part of what I'm going to talk about next is really sort of the different sort of st steps that we think, components that we think are part of the software data center. Now, you might be asking, you know, okay, in that case, uh, what's sort of the role of hardware? Well, obviously, hardware is still important. Hardware is still, you know, sort of what, what runs the software. Um, and the trend that we've seen is that, you know, as more and more of these services move up into a sort of a software layer, the hardware will become more, more homogenized, which is good for, you know, IT departments and, and how you run your infrastructure because you want more homogeneity. Um, but a lot of the folks at hardware will be increasingly about sort of getting better speeds, better utilization, offloading the software layer. So, you know, things like TCP offloads, those go into the hardware. Um, or you may have specialized ASICs where latency is really important and, and again, the hardware will, will be a specialized application. But ultimately, we believe that the software sort of is where you, you need the ability to sort of control that hardware. So even if it is hardware, it still needs to be possible to virtualize it and, and be possible to control it. So how do we go from this journey from virtualization to the software-defined data center? Well, here's sort of what we discovered. Um, so the first step of the virtualization journey is that you find that your data center has become very dynamic. And so it sort of requires a new way of operating, one that can, t can, can handle that level of change. Um, and then we sort of get into the resources, the software-defined storage or the virtual networking. Those are the other set of resources that we need to virtualize. And then finally, with the sort of cloud service provisioning pr uh, problem, you want to be able to pull this all together. You've got compute, storage, networking, and you want to pull it together and you know, add policy, it, you know, make, it, make it sort of uh, integrated with the way you do business. Now, um, you know, we believe at VMware that we have this product called the vCloud Suite, and it's a step along the, it, you know, it, it, it represents a suite of uh, technologies and tools that take us along this. Um, but, you know, this is, this is a bigger vision, and there's a lot more to be done. Um, and I'll sort of talk about some of that. So next I'm going to sort of drill down into those, each of those uh, steps in the, in the journey um, and just talk through them, you know, one or two slides each. Um, so, you know, first of all, the basis that you need to have is you need to have good virtualization. You need to have virtualization be able to cover all the applications. And so what I'm showing you up here is a chart that we've taken as a survey from our customers that sort of describes some of the most demanding workloads. So the, the Exchange servers, the SQL servers, the, the SAPs, um, you know, these are the applications that have been the slowest to virtualize. And we're making good progress between, you know, 2010, 2012, you can see the numbers are increasing. And so we continue to drive through and try to make sure that all the workloads can be virtualized so that you can actually run you know, any workload you know, on the software-defined data center. As I mentioned, um, you know, when you get into a virtual world, things are much more dynamic. Things change. Um, you know, a virtual machine could actually move you know, we have this feature called D Distributed Resource Schedule, DRS, where virtual machines may move around automatically to load balance. Um, you know, changing where the services run hosts is traditionally a, a change that requires an ITIL process. Um, so a lot of the existing sort of IT uh, approaches and tools and processes are really around controlling change. And that might be fine for the physical world, but in the virtual world, change happens a lot more easily. And as I was saying earlier, you know, if you want more agility, you sort of have to kind of embrace change. Um, and so, to sort of help with that, um, we have this, this, this suite called the Operations Management Suite. What we did basically was we took these capacity management tools we had, performance monitoring and, and configuration management, and we bundled it together and pull, pulled that data together into one dashboard. And it's kind of hard to see, but this, this screenshot here is sort of this, this dashboard we have that sort of lets you see your, uh, the way your data center is operating, and it sort of groups into three columns. Um, these columns, um, you know, sort of organized based on um, sort of how, how your data center is operating, the health of it, you know, what kind of things are at risk, um, you know, things that you might have to action on in the future, and as well as your efficiency. You know, are there, are there loads you can consolidate? Are there virtual machines you can get rid of? Um, so this is a very, you know, interesting product and one that's been um, really well received by our customers lately. And, um, you know, one of the things that I can mention... Am I doing something? Ooh. Okay, um, so I hope you heard of that. <laughs> um, and so, so one of the things that we're at, we're, we've been working on, you might see the announcements we're adding to this, is the ability to add event and log streams and indexing um, with this so that you can not only add uh, you know, the, the capacity, performance um, metrics, but you know, we're also increasingly integrating log data with this view. Storage. 
Storage is you know, largely about storing and retrieving data, but the way in which you store and retrieve that data makes a big difference. For some of your applications and your data, it's really important to protect it. So you might have backup, you, you most certainly have backup. Uh, you, know, you might do some replication for the really important workloads and you might make use of sort of snapshot capabilities. Um, on the other side of a storage, the retrieval side, you need to make sure that the applications are close to data and they can retrieve the data in a timely fashion. Otherwise, your users are going to complain about the experience um, not being able to access their data. And so, uh, in the area of storage, um, you know, it's, it's, it's really costly to sort of make sure that you have the right kind of storage. Um, sorry, I didn't, mean, I didn't mean it was costly to kind of storage. It's really costly to, a lot of the techniques we have storage is around copying data and, and distributing it, and it's really costly to move data, large amounts of data around. So what you want is you want the ability to have your data utilizing the right kind of storage, the right kind of access pattern fitting the right kind of storage. So mission critical data, of course that needs to be replicated on, on sort of more expensive storage, but you know, data is just there to serve you know, a catalog. Um, you know, that perhaps could be more of a cache. Um, so you don't necessarily want really expensive storage for that. Now, into this space, you know, VMware is continuing to add things to the hypervisor and we're com coming up with sort of uh, some other interesting storage options that I think will sort of complement sort of what's out there in the industry. Um, before I get into sort of what we're, what we're doing specifically, one of the things I want to talk about also is what we're doing with our ecosystem. So there's this concept of this virtual volume. And what this idea is, is that we're trying to give you, we're trying to work with the storage partners and um, like IBM and actually make sure that the storage arrays are aware of what data is coming from which virtual machine. And so the idea is that as the as the virtual machine is created, you could actually send down some kind of tag that sort of says that, you know, this is this data that's coming for, is coming for this specific virtual machine. And once that basically will allow the array to do is it will allow the array to basically, you know, offer you know, features like quality service, or it may allow the array to actually snapshot an individual virtual machine. Um, Contrast that to sort of how it works today. You know, sort of the array-based, the hardware capabilities you have today largely work at the LUN level. And so, you, you, it, 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 if you have a group of VMs on a LUN, it, it snapshots or or it gives you a certain quality service for entire for the entire LUN, the group of virtual machines. With virtual volumes, the array is now able to operate on an individual virtual machine level basis. And we think this is a really exciting development. Um, this is taking a little while because it's got to make its way through the standards committee, and it's actually now a standard. Um, but you know, look for this sort of interesting development. I think this is going to be a big development in the future. Some of the other kinds of storage um, enhancements we've been making um, is you know we, we just baited uh, this um, thing called virtual sand. Um, the idea behind a virtual sand is sort of like a sand. Um, um, essentially, what we're doing is we're taking all this sort of local direct attached storage on the on the servers, and we're, we're you know we've got clusters you know with virtualization. We're trying to build these storage clusters um, with these local storage, and so. Um, this is different than this, if you are familiar with our products, this is different than this idea of a storage pod where you can move to any one of the, the, the um, local storage. In the case of virtual SAN, the, 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 we cluster the blocks together, we use things like you know, rain, we spread the, the blocks out so that you get better performance um, and you get availability. So for example, if one of the nodes in the cluster you know, uh, becomes unavailable, it goes down for some reason, uh, vSAN will automatically bring up the blocks, replicate them on another node. And so, you know, virtual, a virtual SAN, vSAN, you know, will solve a lot of use cases. Um, we think it'll actually bring down the cost of storage, but, you know, obviously it won't replace, you know, sort of your really mission critical, um, you know, data stores. So it's not going to replace the array, but, but we think this, this gives you more choice and, and a cheaper storage offer, option for some use cases. Um, so, you know, Flash is, a, you know, a very important development in storage, and um, one of the things that we're also, you know, offering in our latest beta is this ability to use uh, Flash as a cache uh, on the server. And so um, we're using Flash, uh, we, we are offering Flash as a resource you can configure per virtual machine and um, you can basically you know, specify how much you want to give to a particular virtual machine. It becomes a read cache so that your virtual machines can run faster. And um, you know, this acquisition we did uh, last year called Versto, um, you know, sort of has some IP around sort of how you can better lay the, the, the disk, disk blocks out. And this basically gives us a way to do much more efficient snapshots. Um, and so we continue to also to look to, to provide additional capabilities, um, like snapshot capabilities, um, sort of at the virtualization layer. Yep. So looking back at the slide, we have the storage 
And then you have your virtual flash. So is it like a tiering of the storage, or is it going to be um, right? So additional storage. Right. Um, so, the, so the question was, you know, I, I have this virtual sand here and flash here. Am I trying to describe that there's a tier of storage? Um, yes and no. Um, the, the actual way we're planning to offer, you know, these these uh, different storage options. Um, so, the case of a vSAN, that's actually storage. You're actually persisting it. And if you look, you know, here, there's this little SSD device here. So, we actually use SSD devices on. If if, if your server has them, we'll use SSD devices. And so, we actually do have this sort of storage tiering built in um, to vSAN. Um, Virtual flash is not actually, um, you, you can think of it as a way of adding tier to the existing storage. Um, so there are interesting implications as to sort of how these would interoperate. I'm afraid, I'm afraid I don't, I think I don't actually understand it well enough to know whether you would actually use these two in conjunction. Um, it may be that you would only use one or the other and you wouldn't mix the two. But one thing I'll mention is that the flash is actually primarily for read. Um, you know, we're not actually using, um, you, if you have a, if you need, if you have loads that you want that, you know, uh, well, oftentimes it's very important that you actually write the data through. And so, um, you know, I think the virtual flash is really more of sort of this read indexing scenario. Uh, but virtual SAN, you know, because it's clustered, um, it, it can actually, it will actually use the flash um, for both read and write uh, data. Question? I know this may be going too deep in the weeds here, but do you uh, have some sort of idea about the limitation on how much local virtual cache you can have in virtual flash? Is there going to be a max? Is there going to be so, so? Is there any? Is there going to be maximum on the amount of virtual flash you have? Um, well, I assume that virtual flash is going to be smaller than, than the virtual the rotating media storage. Um, and what I've heard of these cases right now is that it, it, it sounds like to me that you know you can use up as much flash as you have actual rotating media storage. Okay, so. In the, in the area of networking, let's see how am I doing on time. Okay, um, so in the area of networking, um, you know, with one of the things we discovered with virtualization was that virtualization is great because it lets you decouple, you know, the virtual machine from the hardware. But when we got to networking, that wasn't quite as true. Um, what we found was that, you know, while, while, while we could pull all kinds of tricks and move virtual machines anywhere in the data center, a lot of times your application won't be very happy if the virtual machine moves to a different subnet. So at the end of the, at the, end of the day, the application matters. And if the virtual machine is not in sort of a place where it could still be a regional network, you know, it's not actually there from the perspective of the, of the application. And so these constraints that we have around networking where you have subnets, you've partitioned it um, for very good reasons, for performance reasons, um, for security reasons, actually lead to sort of um, an inability to move the virtual machine to where you want it to be. And so networking is actually inhibiting sort of your ability and your freedom to basically put the machine, the workloads where you want them to be. And so in the area of sort of software-defined networking, um, you know, we're trying to break those boundaries. You know, a couple years ago we announced this initiative called VXLAN, which lets you take, you know, we work with our networking partners and lets you extend the network across, you know, L3 uh, domains, uh, L3 zones. Um, but we're continuing to push on that, continue to, to improve the performance and uh, improve sort of the degree to which you can expand connectivity. So once you've expanded, and, and you know, that's sort of one of the big things that Nasira is doing. Now, once you've expanded connectivity so that it can be anywhere, um, one of the things you now need to do is, you, need to, you know, network is not just the connectivity, it's also the services. If your enterprise allows DHCP, then you know, you would, you would want to make sure you have DHCP address, the server installed. Um, off, you, of course, you have firewalls and, and um, you know, IDS systems, and those services, those layer sort of, you know, four and higher ser services also need to be deployed. Um, otherwise, you know, you don't really have that much. You can't actually use it. Now, one other thing I want to mention about the networking um, is that you know, because the network touches everything, um, we are approaching networking in such a way where we're trying to virtualize the network for everything. We're not stopping with the, uh, you know, the uh, vSphere hypervisor, the VMware hypervisor, and we're not stopping with the VMware management stack. So on this diagram, I'm just basically showing that, um, you know, the network virtualization efforts we have ongoing are aiming to be, um, you know, extremely heterogeneous. Um, in addition, they could also potentially even support, hopefully they can support ability to go between the private cloud and the public cloud. Question. question. Would you say that VMware is leading this charge, or would you say that the networking partners are leading the charge? Uh, so the question is, would I say that VMware is leading this charge, or the networking partners leading this charge? Um, 
You know, I, I would say, this is a very interesting question. I, I, my, my gut sense, given what my perspective is, that I believe that, uh, you know, Nucera, our acquisition, they were leading the charge. There are a bunch of other startups that have been leading the charge. Um, and I believe, you know, network vendors like Cisco, you know, they've come around. They see the value. And, and they, again, networking is one of those spaces where hardware is very important. You know, the shuttling packets around, you, you know, that requires um, very low latencies. Um, so I, I do believe that, uh, you, know, th you know, things are coming around. Um, in this, if I should expand your question, I would actually say in the storage space, I would actually say that the storage, our storage partners actually are the ones that are leading the charge storage, um, you know, defines a uh, software defined storage. So it is an interesting uh, dynamic there between, uh, you know, in the industry, what's going on. Yeah, no, for, for answer, I, I would agree with you on that in both cases. Okay, well, I'm going to try to wrap up in just a couple minutes. So I just got a couple more slides I just wanted to point out. Um, so, you know, at, at the end of all this, you've got this virtual compute, virtual storage, virtual networking, um, and you want to pull, you need to pull it together, right? So, so one of the things we've heard a lot from our customers is the, the desire to be able to create your own self-service portals. Some of you have may have already done that, um, and with these sort of self-service portals, you can then build into your own, you know, you can build in. Um, integrations so that you can actually integrate with your workflows, your business workflows, your IT workflows, and you can also add policy. You can add policy controls. So, you know, you know, on top of sort of what the, the um, you know, Software Defined Data Center offers you out of the box. And so uh, these are some very important capabilities as well, um, and we believe that there's this sort of layer on top, you know, this is sort of, this is sort of the layer that puts it all together. Um, so you know, the gentleman's question today about the ecosystem, I think, is a good one. And so, you know, I, I think the, the point I want, I want to sort of leave you with is that the software data center is basically this is this movement, it's this direction. It's kind of like virtualization. You know, um, you know, VMware is a big part of that, but you know, we actually understand that you know we're not going to be able to offer every kind of service around storage, networking, and even compute to some degree. Um, and so we've got these programs with our partners, um, and we're going to be working with our partners to make sure that the best of breed hardware and software um, can basically make its way into the software-defined data center. Um, and so. You know, we think this vision is compelling. It basically lets um, you run more efficiently, more safely, um, and above all, you know, the goal here is really to achieve a degree of agility that wasn't possible before. Um, so, you know, I'm going to just skip through some last slides really quickly because I want to let you run to your next uh, um, your, your next session. But uh, you know, just just the last slide here is that you know our goal here is to really get to the point where. Um, you know, instead of sort of having IT being seen as a place where the brakes are put onto projects, um, we want to enable IT to basically to, you know, meet the demands and, and the desire of customers to be much more agile. You want to be able to help, your customers want to be able to help themselves, they want to be able to get the workloads right away, they want to be able to make them bigger or smaller as they need, and, you know, they, they want to pay for it in such a way that they pay for it as they use it. And so, we, we believe that in, in IT, you know, the, the role of IT is basically to make sure that things are safe and secure still. And if anything, IT has more choices now for how to do things. Now, um, if, if, you, if, if, if you're in IT and you do believe you still want to run your own cloud, we want to make sure um, that you can do that. And we believe that the Software Defined Data Center is the best way to do that. And so there's another session that I'll be giving later today and also tomorrow uh, afternoon that goes more in detail into sort of the vCloud suite, the, the different components, what they can do. Um, and so that session is later today. There's also one um, you know, this tomorrow afternoon. Um, the other session I want to point you to also is that there's another session given one of my colleagues um, who will talk about sort of what you know, VMware is doing with IBM and you can sort of see that, you know, in fact, um, you know, IBM is also very much sort of participant in helping us move to the software defined data center. Well, thank you uh, for uh, showing up this morning and I apologize for the late start. Um, I won't make that mistake again. Um, and have a good conference. Mm -hmm.